I'm really happy to share this conversation with Shane Claiborne. Where are you at? <laughs> I'm in Sweden. I'm on an island of Sweden called Gotland. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I've been to Sweden, Sweden a few times. <laughs> but probably not to Gotland yet. I don't think so. It's been- well, you're doing all right, Katie. Thanks for reaching out. Well, thanks so much for being willing to talk. It's a lot of these conversations on my YouTube channel have been like my free therapy of working through some stuff. <laughs> okay. I have no idea how long this whole deconstruction to reconstruction process has been going on, but I was realizing today that it kind of started, I mean, this book was a pretty, pretty big part of it, but way back when I first read it, I was still very entrenched in the evangelical world, thinking that that's the only right way to be a Christian. Yeah. (laughs) And (laughs) I wanted to read a little bit of this for people who don't know who you are, don't know what the whole, you know, living counterculturally revolutionary means. Because I think, I feel like it's just, I know there's a lot of other people out there going through some stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Religious extremists of all faiths have perverted the best of our traditions, but there is another movement stirring, a little revolution of sorts. Many of us are refusing to allow distorted images of our faith to define us. There are those of us who, rather than simply reject pop evangelicalism, want to spread another kind of Christianity, a faith that has as much to say about this world as it does about the next. New prophets who are rising up to try to change the future, not just predict it. There is a movement bubbling up that goes beyond cynicism and celebrates a new way of living, a generation that stops complaining about the church it sees and becomes the church it dreams of. And this little revolution is irresistible. It is a contagious revolution that dances, laughs, and loves. (laughs) (laughs) So... For our conversation, it's not like an interview. I think you could probably figure that out. It's more of a, I want to have us just a heart to heart. Cool. Yeah. Just be people that are, that are dealing with their frustration and are just, ah, this world is so annoying. Every single bar you look, it just makes you crazy. (laughs) Sorry. I'm a little bit intense. I have that effect on people. (laughs) No, it's all good. Oh, good. Well, I, you know, I, I kind of, um, well, one of the things I've found really uh, life giving is being surrounded by folks who believe the world can be different, you know, and um, are trying to live that out. And, you know, when you, when you're like a teenager, you always hear about peer pressure as a bad thing. And I suppose it can be, but I think there's a, a positive peer pressure too, you know, that if you want to, we tend to rub off on each other, you know, so we tend to become like the people we hang out with. So I've, um, I've enjoyed hanging out with people that, that are, are revolutionaries, you know, they believe that the world can be different and they're not willing to normalize, you know, shootings of gun violence and hatred, uh, in the name of God and all that stuff. So, you know, I think if you want, if we want to be more generous, you hang out with generous people. And if you, want to be more courageous you hang out with courageous people and if you want to be more cynical and narcissistic then you just hang out with those folks and watch you know reality tv (laughs) your favorite kind (laughs) to you what does it mean to be a jesus follower oh wow well you know the word christian uh means christ-like or little you know it's 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 it means that we were trying to reorder our whole life around Jesus. And uh, the irony is, you know, that Gandhi captured so well, as he said, uh, you know, they asked him about Christianity and he said, I love Jesus. I just wish the Christians acted more like him. (laughs) And I think there's a lot of us that feel that way, you know? So I I think, you know, to really be a a Christian is to try to, um, as Mother Teresa said, leave off the fragrance of Jesus with our lives. And I think it's to commit our lives to love. Jesus said that they'll know that you belong to me by your love. And it certainly isn't what many evangelical Christians have become known for, but it is what 
Jesus was known for. And, and um, it, that's what we aspire to, you know, to live lives that, that um, are loving and, and, and love disrupts. You know, I think love is, it, we're not talking about, you know, like Dostoevsky said, not the sentimental love of storybooks and fairy tales, but this is the harsh and dreadful love <laughs> that keeps you up at night, that gets you put in jail, that, you know, flips tables in the temple. So it's, it's uh, you know, it's that kind of love too. It's a love that's not just uh, sentimentalism. Yeah, that reminds me of this thing, this joke song I used to sing back in the day. And they'll know we are Christians because we're right, because we're right. <laughs> yeah, I actually <laughs> like that old, you know, the old original version of that. That's a good song, you know, they'll know that we are Christians by our love. But and it's not our doctrines and T-shirts and bumper stickers, you know, all the clutter of Christianity. In, in some ways, I kind of feel like the more you have to brand something, the less authentic it is, you know, so, it's, it, it, you know, I, some of the greatest, you know, the, the most uh, Christ-like folks I've, I've encountered in my life, they didn't have all the, the, the Christian paraphernalia merch, <laughs> but they had a life that looked a lot like Jesus. It's this Christian culture. <clears throat> This Christian culture where it's really easy to wear the right stuff, say the right words, and worship in a way that people think, oh, wow, what a holy person you are, or even lead worship, but it's, but you don't see any fruit in their lives afterwards. Or you think that you see fruit in their lives, but then crazy stuff happens and they're suddenly defending police brutality and attacks on the Capitol. Like, who are you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what did, what yeah, happened to you? You taught me better than this. Yeah. Have you heard that song Dan Dietrich yeah. wrote, uh, him to the 81%? Yeah. I was just talking to him earlier. In fact, he's going to sing it on Pentecost as a love song to the church, but you know, he wrote that song, um, uh, you know, and it, it just calls out some of that hypocrisy, but I think it's important that you know, this was this this is an old uh, an old struggle that even Jesus, you know, his harshest words were not for people on the fringes of the faith, but it was for the people that were at the center of the religious elite. You know, uh, the, the, those are the folks he he called a brood of vipers. <laughs> you know, and he said your religion is just heaping heavy burdens on people. It's not liberating. It's not good news. And he says to the, you know, to the teachers of the law and the religious folks he says the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom ahead of you <laughs> and so it's kind of like yeah all the people you've excluded are actually coming into the kingdom ahead of you so i, I think that's you know the challenge of uh, what jesus does and you know so it, it, we can take some um uh courage from that you know that this was also a struggle for jesus um and it's been a you know um in the, even in the scripture, you know, there's there's places where uh, God says, I didn't know you, you know, and we and there people say, well, but we did all these things in your name. You know, we had all the T-shirts. We listened to all the music. And, you know, but I think really in the end, um, our faith has to manifest itself in real concrete acts of love and compassion and justice. And that's what, you know, Matthew 25 and Jesus's final account of the judgment. Uh, it's not a doctrinal test, you know, that God says, okay, virgin birth, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree. But it's actually, you know, God says to us uh, that when I was hungry, did you feed me? Did, did you visit me in prison? Did you welcome me when I was an immigrant or a refugee or homeless, you know? And so, you know, I think that that's really uh, in the end, what our, what our faith has to look like. Amen. Preach. <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to preach on YouTube. I didn't mean to get too preachy, but well, yeah, I mean, it, it's my channel. I can do what I want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would love, even though it's in your book and I, people should definitely read it. And I know you've written plenty of other books since then, but this is like the one that has like been with me um, to hear about your time with Mother Teresa and how much that affected you. Yeah, sure. And first of all, you've got the original there. That that's like the 
2006 version or something that I, 10 years in, I don't know if I have a copy here, but they, they someone had a great idea. It wasn't me, but to do a, a 10 year edition where I went through and I wrote kind of like notes in the margins about, you know, how things have evolved over the decades since I wrote the book. So there's that version too. But, um, and even that, the, the version you have, I'm kind of hiding behind the cover. They wanted my big old face on the cover and I'm like, I don't really Phil, I don't really want that, you know, put me kind of hiding behind it. And then I got all those other pictures of our community and the movement, you know, on the inside. So I fought hard for those. But yeah, I, you know, a, a real monument, a real, real like transformative moment for me was when I was in um, undergrad, you know, in, in college. And um, as we started asking the question, you know, who's really taking the gospel seriously? You know, who's not just got the doctrines, but got the lifestyle that we see Jesus talking about, sell what you have and give it to the poor, love your enemies, you know, visit those who are homeless and in prison. And, and Mother Teresa was still alive. And so we thought, you know, who better to learn from? And we, we wrote her a letter and we didn't hear back. So then we ended up, um, I call, I started calling some nuns and most of them thought I was a prank caller. You know, I didn't know much about the Catholic world, so I wasn't even calling the right order of her, you know, sisters, but they, I finally tracked down a number and I called it. And the, the wild thing was that, you know, this is before cell phones. So I called from a, a pay phone, which young people, these were things that we actually put coins in to make, you know, anyway, but you know, it was great. So I'm in my college, you know, lounge, of our, our dormitory and my friends are there and we did our homework. So we, we, um, you know, I, I found out that I needed to call in the middle of the night. So it would be a decent hour in India. And I'm expecting a polite receptionist or something, you know, missionaries of charity, how can we help you? And, and mother Teresa answers the phone and she just, you know, hello. And I, I really thought I might have the wrong number. And it was a lot of quarters going in that, that pay phone. So I, I, I said, listen, I'm, we're trying to get a hold of the missionaries of charity because we want to come work with Mother Teresa and the nuns. And she goes, yeah, this is Mother Teresa. <laughs> and, and, so, and, you know, once you like know more about her, it's very characteristic. It's not that surprising that she picked up her own phone, you know. But, um, you know, I asked her, can we come work with you? And she said, yeah. And uh, then I started thinking very you know, rationally, like, okay, where do, where do we sleep? You know, I'm, I'm not thinking they got a Marriott in Calcutta or something. So, and, and Mother Teresa says back, hey, God takes care of the lilies and the sparrows. God will take care of you. And uh, that's what she said. <laughs> and, I, and I thought to myself, I hope that works when I tell my mom that, you know, that where are you staying? Oh God, we're going to live like the lilies and the sparrows. But we did, you know, we, we went over and we ended up living right across the street from where mother Teresa and the, the sisters lived. I worked in the home for the dying every day, her first home where we brought people off the streets who were dying and of tuberculosis of poverty of all kinds of things, you know? Um, and we, we weren't there necessarily to keep them alive, but to, make sure they didn't die alone. And with someone holding their hand and singing to them, massaging their muscles and feeding them, you know, sharing food with them. So that was just very holy work. I did that, you know, every day I worked in the orphanages and it's it just amazing, beautiful life changing work that we, we got to be a part of. Hmm. It's interesting that the concept of death where there's, there's, there's some Christians who are kind of like, yeah, we're, it's a celebration of life and we're with Jesus now, but they don't really talk about the, ask the, the physicalness of it. The, the, I don't know, I'm not talking very well. You were face to face with it. And when you wrote about the way that people would say namaste to you, mm. that was just so impactful. Like, I'd love to hear you share a little bit about that namaste thing. Yeah, well, well, first of all, there was sort of this paradox, you know, because you're on the one hand, the, there were a lot of nurses and, and folks that volunteered with in the home for the dying. And some of them would be pretty upset that these people didn't need to die, like they just needed an IV, or they needed some simple medication that would save their life. So there was that piece of it. But there was another piece of this that Mother Teresa was really known for, which is that that, that what, what we need to do is, is confront death and take away the sting of death, right? So we're not fe fearful of death. And, and that's why she would say, like, our job is not to, 
keep people alive, but let them die with dignity. And, and, so, and, and when you went into the morgue, I mean, there was a morgue right there in the home and you would take the bodies. Um, it said, I'm on the wall. It said, I'm on my way to heaven. And then as you flipped around, it said, thank you for helping me get here. And my friend said, uh, it kind of feels like we're travel agents, you know, between this world and the next, you know, we're just kind of helping people transition. And I, so, I mean, there, you know, there was this kind of like paradox that on the one hand, you wanted people to have the access to the best care that they could. On the other hand, there's a lot of people in industrialized countries that have the best medical and scientific technology, but they don't have anyone holding their hand when they die. And I think that's what I really realized is, is that sometimes it's not just about how efficient we are, but how much love we, we have. And some of our systems are not conduits of, of love very well. You know, you can have good housing and not have a warm home with people that love you. And, and, you know, I think the same is true of our healthcare systems. As much as we want good healthcare, we also, and so Mother Teresa, one of the things she says is what's important is not how much we do, but how much love we put into doing it. So we're not just called to do great things, but small things with great love. And that's what I, you know, we practiced. And you, you mentioned the word namaste. It's a word that I, you know, like people know it if they do yoga or something, but it's a really holy, you know, like mystical word. And I, I, I think I first realized the power of it when there was a man who I spent a week in a place where we treated folks who had skin diseases, leprosy, really. I mean, it was skin diseases that they were ostracized for. Because in India, you still have the caste system where you're literally outcast. Like you can't go in stores, you can't go in restaurants. And so this community of folks that were um, really uh, marginalized, but uh, they, they formed a community together, 300 families, and Mother Teresa um, kind of helped them get this land, and the name of the, the village was Gandhiji Primnivas, Gandhi's New Life, that's what it means, and so they're, you know, they're making their own clothes, they made the saris that all the, that Mother Teresa and all the nuns wear were made in this little village, and, you know, they grew their own food, they made their own prosthetic, um, arms and legs out of wood that they would custom make for each person. So it was, but there was a clinic there and there was one day where my job was to roll cotton balls that they had grown. And I would roll the cotton balls for the folks that were um, all the people that were treating each other were recovering from leprosy. And so um, one of them had to leave early and he grabbed me and said, you, you do this. And so I sat down in his seat and I started treating this man. And as I looked into his eyes, he said, namaste. And one of the guys said, do you, I, mean, I know that you hear that word. Everybody in India says it, but do you know what it means? And I said, I don't know that I know what it means. And, and he said, it means the holy one in me honors the holy one in you. And so it's a, it's a greeting, you know, but it's a holy greeting. It's a way of saying, uh, you are made in the image of God. And do you recognize that in me? It's kind of this invitation. So you often say it back. So he said, namaste. And when he said that, you know, I had this strange sense that I wasn't just looking into the eyes of some poor man with leprosy in India, but I was looking into the eyes of, of Jesus. And that, that's what Jesus says. When you do it unto them, you do it unto me, you know. And, and so I, I really believe that. Um, and I had, you know, I had this wild epiphany that, Maybe he feels like he's not just looking into the eyes of some crazy young white kid from America, but he can see a little of the, you know, God's love in me. So that's, you know, it's a beautiful word. And, and I think we, um, we do well to recapture it because we don't even have a great English translation, but just this kind of reverence that every person has the, the imprint of God on them. And how much better would this world be if everybody that called themselves a Christian really lived in that awareness? Yeah, absolutely. Because I, you know, I grew up with the language of being pro-life, but we really only thought about one issue, which was abortion. And it, it, it just confounds me that we are often better at protecting life before birth and life after birth, you know, like uh, that, that on almost every other issue of life, Christians 
have not been the champions of life. We've often been the obstacles. And that's why I've written, you know, my, some of my recent books are addressing this, like gun violence. Christians, evangelical Christians are the highest gun owning demographic in America. We own guns at a higher rate than the general population. Um, when it comes to the death penalty, we're the biggest supporters of the death penalty in spite of the fact that we worship an executed and risen savior that said, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. So like those contradictions really began to get to me, but you're right, Katie, you know, like if we really had a better value of life, um, that was not just pro-birth or anti-abortion, but that really rec recognizes the reverence of, of uh, you know, the sanctity of life that every person's made in the image of God. And that affects, of course, we're going to be a part of the Black Lives Matter movement. Of course, we're going to be passionate about welcoming refugees and fighting against the death penalty and militarism and war. Like, like life matters. You never have let the disappointments with the way Christianity has been misrepresented just leads you into big old doubts, have you? Well, I, I think that there are times where deconstruction is necessary. You know, there's mm -hmm. times, there's things that need to be let go. And like, I grew up with theology that was just not good. It wasn't big enough. It was, you know, th that the God, it put God in a box, you know, like, for instance, you know, if a 12-year-old a, a girl gets raped and your only answer is, well, God must have had this happen for a reason. That's, that's horrible theology, right? So that stuff needs to go. It needs to burn away like the shaft, you know, like, but then I think there's, 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 there's something to um, reconstructing that, you know, and realizing that there is like the answer to bad theology is not no theology, but it's, it's good theology. It's, and if our theology gets in the way of love, that's a pretty good sign that we need to get rid of our theology <laughs> you know, and choose love. Yeah. Um, so I, I have done some deconstruction, but this is one thing that, that I've learned though, Katie, is that um, sometimes the loudest voices in, in the Christian world are not the most beautiful voices or not the most, most faithful voices. And especially as we look at the era of Trump and the white evangelicals that really defended and supported him and forfeited any integrity in order to do it, you know, like, like when you say no to that, for many of us is not the end of our faith. It's the beginning, <laughs> right? It's the beginning of, of something new and better. And the landscape, the spiritual landscape of Christianity is a lot bigger than the kind of toxic white evangelicalism. And that's, that's the good news, you know, is that there, the whole historic black church, there's Pentecostals, there's Catholics, there's all kinds of folks that have had a more authentic and robust faith that has prevailed and that answers those doubts and questions in, in real ways, not in the cheap cliche ways that kind of many of us learn growing up that is that's really encouraging right there that it's it's a beginning it's it's like okay maybe the first 34 years of my life were <laughs> okay not an entire 34 years but maybe however many years of my life I was taught some crap and now I can begin to see who God really is but it's just kind of scary it's like if you've been in an abusive relationship <laughs> with someone who who looks like this and is people talk about them like this and then you find out there's actually a really good person but they look exactly like them and they use a lot of the same language it's like hmm. how can i trust you you look too much like this yeah yeah and i think that's where like leaving one version of of, Christ, of evangelicalism or Christianity that has been so hurtful and so shallow in some ways is um, it, it still allows that the narrative of that toxic Christianity to colonize all 
of the Christian faith, whereas there's some really beautiful things happening outside of that. So I tell a lot of folks that have left the kind of Trump evangelicalism, like lean in to the historic black church, find, you know, as white folks, especially, I think putting ourselves in places where um, we're a minority, right? Where, where like we're not in a majority white setting is really good. There's, there's a healthier theology. It's not that the, you know, the Latino church, the black church, Asian Christians don't have their own holes in their theology or their own um, contradictions or struggles too. But I just think that, 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 that kind of colonizing narrative, you get outside of that and you can find um, more authentic um, faith expressions in a lot of other places. And I'm not willing to just let the kind of Franklin Graham's colonize the whole like narrative of Christianity, you know? So um, yeah. And, and everywhere there's resistance. I mean, Jerusha, Franklin's niece, you know, Billy Graham's granddaughter is a part of the resistance to the, and, and there's all, so there's all over there, those voices, uh, uh, you know, we've had a whole movement um, uh, that we call red letter Christians, you know, named after the, 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 the Bibles that have the words of Jesus highlighted in red and saying, we want to try to live as if Jesus meant the stuff he said. And on our website, there's just so many different, really beautiful life giving voices of, of people of faith. And so, uh, yeah, one of the things we say is the way that we're going to change the narrative is by changing the narrators, right? We need to amplify versions of, our faith that are beautiful and worth believing in. Yeah. Oh, I want to talk to all of them. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll hook you up. Yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, that's what that's what we've got to do. You know, like we one of the things we say is we, we need to harmonize, but not homogenize, you know, and so there's this harmony of different voices. And in some ways that our message is, is as beautiful as we are diverse, you know, and, and so we don't just want like dudes. We don't just want white folks. We don't just want straight folks. We want people who, who they are shapes how they interpret in their faith, you know, and how they hear the gospel. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. So we've talked a bit, I mean, we've talked around it, but I would like to just be really straightforward what kind of damage has American Christianity done to the name of Jesus? Wow. Well, um, we've not just in our country have we done this, but we've ex exported um, this kind of American nationalism that an exceptionalism and the kind of like um, white Jesus, uh, you know, white American Jesus. There's all, you know, that, I don't know if you listen to punk rock, but that old bad religion band, you know, we've got the American Jesus, see him on the interstate. We got the American Jesus. He helped build the president's estate. Do, 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 do. And, uh, but, you know, I mean, that's, it's, it's terrible. And I, I really do believe that one of the, the, the biggest obstacles to Christ is American nationalism that's camouflaging itself as Christianity. Um, and it's also a watered down version of Christianity, right? That is just about believing the right things. And I think that, that our doctrines are important. I mean, we've got a doctrinal statement in our community. I've always uh, held true to the, the, the doctrines of our faith, but like our challenge is not a challenge in believing it's a challenge in living <laughs> you know like living it out fleshing it out and so right right belief is important but so is right living and so you know in, in america i think one of our challenges is kierkegaard said this soren kierkegaard he said where everything is christian nothing is christian and that that's powerful right because we lose our distinctiveness so many of the images that jesus gives of christians of the church are in contrast to the world, right? That we're to be light in the darkness. We're to be salt on the earth. Um, we're to be like yeast in the bread. That we're to, you know, to be this spreading this movement of love. Or as Stanley Hauerwas says, we're meant to be like air fresheners in the toilet. <laughs> we're, we're meant to leave off a beautiful fragrance of love in the world. Uh, so when you have branded on your money, in God we trust, while the American economy looks a lot like the seven deadly sins. <laughs> this is the essence of taking the Lord's name in vain. And I think it, it really is about, 
I mean, so many of the values of America are a direct contradiction to the values of Jesus that we see like in the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are the poor. And we're really good at blessing the rich and the middle class, right? Blessed are the meek. And we don't like meekness. We like, we're proud to be Americans, you know? Like, so I think, you know, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the peacemakers. These are all of the, the direct contradiction, I think, to the values of the sort of um, nationalistic religion. And, and please, like American nationalism has its own icons, you know? Uh, the stars and stripes, the eagle, you know, it's got its own uh, theology, the manifest destiny, the doctrine of discovery, you know, God is doing something special through America, like, and it's got its own gospel songs, you know, with a little G, we, we, you know, like, look at how upset people get when you kneel in the national anthem. So I think there, you know, that reverence of America, when it meshes with Christianity is, is really dangerous. And of course, there's the prosperity gospel. There's all kinds of other ways that we've twisted and distorted the, the gospel of Jesus. But I, I, I believe, you know, my, my friend Richard Rohr, Father Richard Rohr is right. He's, you know, he always says that the, the best corrective for what's gone wrong is the practice of something better. So just as Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world, we, we want to be the change that we want to see in the church. And uh, so that, that's what we're after. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, we're in a mess, you know, here, over here. Um, and I was trying to find a little quote, you know, from uh, uh, old um, Frederick Douglass. You know, he, 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 he really recognized these two different versions of Christianity, right? And he said, I love the pure, peaceable Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slave-holding, women-whipping, cradle plundering Christianity of America. And he said, between the Christianity of Christ and the Christian so-called Christianity of America, like there's so stark a difference that I don't know how you can embrace one as good and the other without, you know, calling the other bad. And so he, he said, I love the Christianity of Christ. I therefore reject the, you know, kind of counterfeit Christianity that backs slavery and the abuse of women and so many of the things that Christians have justified throughout American history. That, oh, oh, deconstruction is grief in so many ways. These stages of grief of, I just remember my world being rocked about finding about, there's some really literal mistranslations in the Bible that have been used to hurt gay people queer people in general and like oh my goodness what else is wrong what else and it's really hard to come out of this cynical angry stage of how much of it was a lie and looking at the people that taught me love is the greatest way and aren't living it and it's like I want to come out of this anger stage and I want to fall in love with Jesus and have a relationship with God. But then I feel like I've said this in so many other of my videos and the, my, my free counseling conversations I have that I pick up my Bible, but I'm like, what evangelical notions are, have, have just laid their stupid eggs in my head that are just there forever. That's just going to taint my view of God and who Jesus is. Mm. So what, what's your relationship with Jesus like? Mm. Well, let me start by saying, I think that all of those, those feelings, you know, as much as they, they grieve me and I think they're, they're so true for so many people. Um, and, um, and, and a, a good place to start is with that, that grief, you know, that, that, um, that, that the church has done a lot of really terrible things. Um, and somehow for me, I think for many of us, Jesus has survived the shameful and embarrassing things that Christians have done in his name. And, um, you know, I, I, I think my, my relationship with Jesus now is, um, 
there, there's that scripture that says we see through a glass dimly, you know? And so I think that like, we've got layers of filters and stuff and funk that we're trying to see through. And, and yet the beauty of Jesus for me is that this is what the new Testament says, the full revelation of God. And that's a powerful statement. Like God is Jesus. And so when you hear about versions of God that don't sound like Jesus, <laughs> then we should be suspicious of them. And I'm, I'm reading a book right now about the, the Old Testament violence, you know, and some of the things that you alluded to, you know, these things that are in scripture that make, can make God really look like a monster, um, a God that's very easy to fear, but very hard to love. And what I see in Jesus is love with skin on you know one of my neighbors said it um really well she speaks spanish as her first language and she said uh, you know we use words like incarnation that can sound so like big and theological and she says but when you order your burrito you know in spanish con carne it means with meat and she said that's what jesus is is god with meat god with skin on incarnate con carne right with flesh and so you know, for me, Jesus is also the interpreting lens that I use when I'm like trying to understand the Bible or trying, trying to understand the world. Jesus is the lens through which I'm, I'm looking at that. So when there are scriptures that feel like they contradict each other, Jesus becomes the referee, you know, for me, like Jesus becomes kind of the sounding board. And, um, and, and what I also see in Jesus is a, a God that leaves all the comfort of heaven to join the struggle here on earth, right? A God who is literally not just con carne in anybody, but comes into a brown skin, Palestinian, Jewish, refugee body, right? <laughs> Bo comes from a town where people said nothing good could come, is executed on the cross, born in a manger because there was no room in the end. Like everything in Jesus is an act of divine solidarity. And so it's no surprise that that's exactly how African-Americans um, resonated with Jesus in spite of the things that white Christians were doing, literally lynching black folks, taking pictures with their dead bodies, and then going to church on Sunday, right? That's what many white Christians were doing. And black folks saw in Jesus one who was lynched, who was hung from a tree. And this act of profound like solidarity of God with us, with those who are hurting. Um, that's, you know, kind of how I think of Jesus, even to the point when he's on the, when he's about to be killed, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, you can chew on that for a little while, you know, like, like God felt the absence of God. And so I think when we feel that long loneliness, that, that space that, that we can remember that this is a part of what Jesus felt too. Um, and yet I also believe that Jesus triumphed he, on the cross, absorbed all the violence, the hatred, of this world in order to subvert it with love, with forgiveness, with an empty tomb. But it's that, you know, he puts the, the, all of the evil on display so we can see what we are capable of. And then we see God's love on full display in contrast to that, you know, subverting the whole hatred in our own hearts, the systems that execute people in our streets, um, all of that is put on full display. And um, so that's, you know, there's that, that's kind of how I think of Jesus. But I also think of Jesus, you know, like one of the things I learned from Mother Teresa is that our faith is not just a theory, but uh, it's, it's a romance. It's a love relationship. And so even when I think about Jesus and prayer and things like I there's there's an element of friendship you know there's an element of trying to like just um be together especially in in times that are hard that you like like my wife and i we we don't always have words you know sometimes you talk sometimes you just hold each other and i think like my relationship to god is not that much different when it comes to what that 
that feels like, you know, um, I, I'll just tell you one, one last quick thing. I remember this reporter asked Mother Teresa if she was married, which was really a weird question, you know, but I thought maybe the whole nun thing was new to him, you know, but he said, are you married? And, uh, and she said, well, I, I am deeply in love. And sometimes my spouse can be so demanding. <laughs> and she's talking about Jesus, you know. So that's also why I find it so funny when my evangelical friends say that Catholics don't really believe in a personal relationship with God. And I'm like, yeah, Mother Teresa called Jesus her lover, her spouse. Like, it doesn't get much more intimate than that. So that's a little, I mean, it's hard to put words to all that. But those, that, those are just a few of the, thing, the ways that I, I think about Jesus. Oh, it's, it's very encouraging. Like I was like choking up a second ago. <laughs> it's like feeling like the people that I trusted and respected are the way they are now that there's like this wall there and knowing so many other people are so separated from from their families because of all this. I've just, yeah. I just, used, I used to kind of hold back about my deconstruction kind of feelings on my channel until opportunities to talk to people came and it just kind of came out when I talked to this filmmaker named David Hoffman and just my feelings about so many things came out and then I just was like, I'm going for it full force. like talking with my with some African American friends, like talking about the slave Bible, learning about all these things. It's like the further yeah. back you go, the more you see, whoa, 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 whoa. Empirical Christianity has been going on since the assembly of the Bible with freaking Constantine. Like uh, hmm. I don't know where I was going with that. It just kind of goes <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to tell you that um, my power went out, so our power's out, which which also means my computer's going to crash uh, in just a second here because I've got this old school computer that if it's not plugged in, it dies. Okay. The battery battery doesn't work. But I want to tell you how. I just want to tell you how much um, I, I think both your 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 grief and your hope for something better means so much and I think a lot of people are looking for that you know um so yeah bless you and all those who are listening you know I think that uh um, keep leaning into Jesus you know keep finding communities that reflect the sort of love that we wish we might have experienced in whatever version of church that that we we may not have seen that in and uh yeah, I, I think that the future of the church is um, is is ours. You know, we we have an opportunity to live out something better than than maybe the the and it, it's got to come with humility too, right? And realizing that uh, I don't think people are looking for a perfect church; they're looking for an honest church. They're mm -hmm. looking for Christians that are honest, not perfect. But too for too long, we've we've acted like we're perfect, yeah. and we've. Enough Pointed fingers at everybody else, right? Like enough with the celebrity pastors and the big shows. Yeah. Enough. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard so many people. I've heard so many people say like we're losing young people not because we we didn't entertain them or have a good worship band, but because we didn't dare them to take the gospel seriously you know to like and we promise people life after death when a lot of people are asking is there life before death you know doesn't the gospel have anything to say about racism and police shootings and poverty and the environment and it does you know every time you look at jesus he's talking not just about going up when we die but bringing god's dream on earth while, while we live so keep at it and um yeah folks can keep up with us at red letter christians too you know follow us on so, so follow me on social media and all that stuff i don't have a youtube channel katie but i think red letter christian does so maybe we'll have you on it again but thank you for having me thank you so much so the way that i end my my um videos is i give hugs hugs
Okay. <laughs> Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. On this channel, I have all kinds of conversations with wonderful, talented, big hearted, compassionate people. I really hope you'll stick around and subscribe and join me in these heart, heart changing, life affirming conversations. Hugs. <laughs>